Let us pray. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you and we praise you because there is no other God like you. You are an awesome God. A mighty God. A God that can do everything but fail. Lord, as we come now to this appointed place, standing behind this sacred desk to preach your sacred word to your sacred people, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. You are my strength. You are my redeemer. And besides you, there is no other. So speak in such a way that the lost will be saved. And that the saved will be encouraged and backsliders will come back to you. If someone is in need of a church home, I pray that they would even join right here this morning at Bible Way. So Lord, give me preaching grace. Give your people hearing grace. Give us all doing grace. And we'll be careful to praise you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together and praise the Lord. He's worthy to be praised. How great thou art. Amen. I hadn't, we hadn't sung that in a while, Brother Winston. But God is an awesome God. How great thou art. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody needed to be reminded Sometimes we make our problems too big. But the God that we serve, he's bigger than our problem. Do anybody know what I'm talking about? Isn't he bigger than your problem? That's why we come to church on a regular basis and give him some of the praise. Give him some of the glory. Oh, you, somebody should have caught that. Amen. We don't just come here to give him some. We come here to give him all the honor and all the glory and all the praise because he's worthy he's worthy he's worthy that alarm clock didn't wake you up this morning somebody say he didn't do nothing for me yes you woke you woke up this morning and you didn't do that on your own. Thank God. All right, all right. Look like you're ready this morning for the word. So put a Bible in your hand and stand to your feet if God has given you the grace to do it and hold it up now. If you got one of these big old heavy Bibles, I got a giant print Bible. Uh, Amen. Amen. Uh, 
and you can put it on your shoulder if you can't. Amen. And repeat after me. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. If I obey it, blessings will come. If I disobey it, curses will come. I am what it says I am. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it tells me to do through the power of God. This is God's idea. I believe that God's idea is the best idea. I'm committed to the biggest thing, the highest thing, the greatest thing, the best thing, which is obeying God. Therefore, my mind is made up. My heart is fixed. My spirit is ready to receive the word of God that will transform my life. Amen. Please remain standing and open up the word of God to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. So good to see so many in the house of the Lord. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4. I want to look this morning at the first four verses, first three verses out of Ephesians chapter 4. Amen. And it reads like this. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Look at verse 1 again. Paul says, I therefore the prison of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. I want to talk with you this morning in the form of a question. Are you walking worthy of your calling? Are you walking worthy of your calling? High five somebody and tell them pastor going to talk about Are you walking? Are you walking? That's a personal. That's a personal question. Are you walking worthy of your calling? I heard a story about a finance committee of a church that contacted one of its rich member who was tight when it came to giving. They told him that our investigation committee at the church have shown that you are in a high tax bracket because you have a high income. And the committee feel like you need to be given a little bit more to the church. And the rich church members said, well, did your investigation committee also show that my mother 
is poor and penniless. Did the investigation committee show that my sister is a single parent? She's trying to raise three kids on her own because her husband was killed in a car accident. Did the committee also show that my brother uh, lost a leg in the war? Did the committee show that? And it's hard for him to take care of his family uh, because now he's handicapped. And the committee member says, no, I investigation committee didn't uh, find those things. He said, well, uh, since I don't give them anything, what make you think I'm gonna give something to the church? <laughs> that, that was a church member that wasn't walking worthy of his calling. How many of you know that one of the biggest problems in the church is people are not walking worthy of their calling? They say that they are Christian, but they don't act like they are Christian. They are a Christian in name, but not a Christian in deed. They got a good talk, but not a good walk. There was a Hindu man uh, once, and he was looking at the behavior uh, of Christians. And he says, if uh, Christians behave like that, then I don't want to be one. That's because those Christians was walking uh, not worthy of their calling. They was walking below it. And when people see Christians walking below the standard uh, of Christianity, uh, then it gives Christianity a bad name. And that's the problem in the church. A lot of Christians uh, are giving Christianity a bad name because they're not walking worthy uh, of their calling. Are y'all going to go with me today? That's why I'm trying to be personal with you this morning and, and ask that question. Are you walking worthy uh, of your calling? Well, let's see this morning. I'm going to take three things off the wagon. Can I give you three things as we talk about walking worthy of the calling? First of all, I want you to see why we ought to walk worthy. Uh, why we ought to walk worthy of our calling. Notice verse 1 again. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech ye that ye walk worthy of the vocation. Oh, that word vocation also means of the calling wherewith ye are called. Notice it starts out, it says, Paul says, I therefore, whenever you see the word therefore, you always got to ask the question, what is it therefore? <laughs> because therefore is a conjunction and it connects where you are to where you have been. It, it, you got to go back. It connects you to, to the past, what he have said in the past. So Paul has been teaching us some things in the past. So when he says, I, therefore, you got to go back and find out what has Paul been talking about uh, in chapter 3. But really, you can't stop there at chapter 3. You got to go all the way back to chapter 1 because what Paul is doing in the first three chapters, he gives you Bible doctrine. And then in chapter 4 through 6, he gives you the duty 
of the Christian. In other words, he teach you first and then he wants you to do. See, a lot of people have gotten their burning before they got their learning. They are just like a race car. They, they spin in rubber and they, and they burn to the, the take off, but they didn't get no instructions on where they need to go. And that's what's happened with a lot of Christians. We done just took off, but we don't know where we ought to be going and what we ought to be doing. And so we got to get our learning before we get our burning. What has Paul been teaching us in these first three chapters uh, about uh, the church? He's been teaching us, number one, that the Trinity was involved in our salvation. Don't you remember that over in chapter one? He talked about how God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and how God the Father has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Then he talked about what God the Son has done. God the Son has redeemed us and by the shedding of his blood has forgiven us of our sin. Then he talked about what God the uh, Holy Spirit has done. God the Holy Spirit has sealed us with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption or the day of Jesus Christ did Jesus come back. And then he moves on into chapter 2. In chapter 2, he talks about how we was dead in our trespasses and in sin. But because of the mercy of God, God has raised us up and made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and that's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then you move on into chapter 3. He talks about the church, the church that was concealed in the Old Testament. The prophets didn't know about it. The preachers didn't know about it. The priests didn't know about it. It was concealed in the Old Testament. But now it is revealed. God has revealed these truths. And what has he revealed? That the Gentiles now are heirs of the promises of Almighty God. Paul got so excited about what God has done in the past. Matter of fact, he closed out chapter 3 with a doxology. He says, now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can imagine or think according to the power that worketh within us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And then Paul even said amen himself. And then he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, beseech you that you are worthy of your calling. In other words, based on everything I just told you, because God the Father was involved in your salvation, because uh, you, you were saved by grace, not by works, lest any man should boast. Because God done broke down the wall of petition and he has brought together Jews and Gentiles making one new man. God done put you in his church. It was God that did that. Now you ought to do something for God. He said, because of what everything God done, done for you in the past and what God is doing right now in the present and what God is going to do for you, even in the future, you ought to serve God. He said, you ought to walk worthy of your calling. And so that's why. We ought to walk worthy of our calling. But he goes on a little bit further and he talks about who should walk worthy. Amen. Number two, who should walk worthy? See, we're moving right along. Are you with me, Bible way? Who should walk worthy? Who, who is the accent that and, and telling you ought to walk worthy? 
Look at what he says here. Out there for verse 1 again, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Who is he talking to? Who's these yous? Notice, notice again, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye, same thing, you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. The you are the call. You call. God call you. So he said, since God done call you, then you need to walk word of the call. Lord have mercy. In other words, it's the Christian people that has answered the call of salvation. Those that are saved, he's saying, saved folks, act like you're saved. Church folks, act like you're in the church. What were they? of your calling. Yeah. See, listen, God never asks unholy people to act holy because they ain't got the capability, the power to do so. He never asks unrighteous people. You ought to stop acting like that and start acting righteous because he know they don't have the power living on the inside of them to act righteous. But he asked you to act righteous because you got the power. I know I'm right about it because we preached about it last week in verse number 20 of, of, of chapter 3. He says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that all that we can ask, I think, according to the power that worketh where? In us. There's a power that's working on the inside of you. There's a power that's working in your mind. There's a power that's working in your heart. There's a power that's working in your will. That's why you gotta walk worthy. Cause you got the power to do so. And it ain't none of your power, it's Holy Ghost power. I know I'm right about it because when you look at 1 Peter, and write this down, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, Peter says, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manners of conversation because it's written, be ye holy. Because God says, I'm holy. Yes, See, you never try uh, to measure up to people out there. Your standard is never to see what somebody else is doing. Because you can always find somebody else that's worse than you. And you making yourself real high because you looking at somebody worse than you. Don't look at somebody worse than you. Look at somebody that's higher than you. And you will always be aiming high for that standard. But to say, how do I know that, that, that we are talking about uh, Christian people? Verse number 23 of still 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. He says, being born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You got something in you that's going to last forever. Amen. Amen. 
You know, they got these batteries, you know, ever ready batteries. But them batteries won't last forever. But what you got in you will last forever. Ever ready batteries gonna wear down and gonna play out. Uh, but not so with God Almighty. He never wears down, never wears out. What were they then of the calling? How do I know that he's talking uh, to church folks and he's talking to saved folks because of chapter 2 of, of Peter, verse number 9 and 10. It says, but ye are a chosen generation, a raw priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You ought to be a different kind of people. Why you want to be different? That ye may show forth the praises of him who has called. Did you see that key word? That has called you out of darkness. God ain't calling you to the same old lifestyle. If you truly say a change done took place, you done been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Which in time past, you was not even a people, but are now the people of God. In other words, you somebody, at one time you was a nobody, but now when you get in the church, you are somebody. Which had not attained mercy, but now, somebody ought to say, but now have obtained mercy. At one time you didn't have the mercy of God on your life, but now you got the mercy of God on your life. You got more, you ought to do more. You ought to be walking worthy of your color. Do you know, I, I looked this up, this word worthy. Uh, and I said, what do this word worthy mean? It means to balance out. It means to balance out. It means to have equal weight on the scale. See, if you say you are a Christian, you ought to act like a Christian. It ought to balance, ought to balance out. If you say you're a child of God, then you ought to act like a child of God. It ought to balance out. If you say you're following the Lord, then you ought to be living like you're following the Lord. It ought to be equal weight on the scale of life. It ought to balance out. The problem is, a lot of church folks, it ain't balancing out. They are saying, I'm a Christian, but they ain't got no weight to it. It ain't balancing out. They say they love the Lord, but they love their sin more than they love the Lord. It ain't balancing out. It ought to have equal weight on both sides of the scale. You know, people that God has truly called and they have truly answered that call, you can tell. Because there's an attitude of gratitude. And that attitude of gratitude is going to balance it out. Oh, I know I'm right. Let me run to the Bible on you. Don't you remember the story of the blind man? How that blind man at first, he was calling Jesus. And they were trying to shut the blind man up, but he kept on calling Jesus. And Jesus heard the blind man. And then Jesus turned around and called 
the blind man and they say blind man the Lord call it for thee and the Bible says he pulled off his garment and he he ran on over there to the Lord and Jesus asked him what do you want me to do for you and he says Lord that I may receive my sight and Jesus immediately healed that blind man and he immediately received his sight and the Bible says and he followed Jesus do you see how it balanced out he was calling him Lord but once he received his sight he started acting like he was his Lord he followed him. Listen, once God done done something for you, you ought not just say, thank you, Jesus, and then turn on around and go back to doing the same old thing. You ought to follow him. It ought to balance out. Let me give you another one. Don't you remember Zacchaeus? You remember Zacchaeus? He was a little bitty fella. And Jesus was coming there to Jericho and, and, and Zacchaeus couldn't see him because of the crowd. And he ran up and got in a tree and got out there on the limb. And the Bible said when Jesus came that way, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come on down. I got to abide at your house. And Zacchaeus came on down and started walking with Jesus. But then all them religious folks, you can tell religious folks. Because religious folks always grumble and mumble. They always got something to complain about. And they start talking about, look at him. He's going to the house of a sinner. But when Zacchaeus heard that, he stopped and he looked at the Lord right in the face. And said, Lord, if I have taken anything by false accusation, I'm going to give them four, four. And I'm going to give to the poor a half that I have. Now, isn't that something? In other words, he called him Lord, but then he made a commitment to start acting like he was Lord. See, it ought to balance out. If, if Jesus is truly your Lord, then you ought to be following him. You ought to be acting like that your Lord that's why the Bible even tell us let the redeemed of the Lord say so he didn't say let that drunkard man say so he didn't say the pimp say so he didn't say the prostitute say so he said let the redeemed the ones that God has shed his blood you don't answer the call of God in your life you done been saved by the blood of Jesus. You done been filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, you done been saved by the blood, filled with his precious Holy Ghost. Then you ought not just sit there like a knot on the law. You ought to say something. Let the redeem or the Lord say so. So who? Who should walk worthy of the calling? Save folks. Save folks. Look like I'm looking at some save folks. Hello, somebody. This is a good time to get saved if you're not saved. So who? It's to save folks. But I got one more thing on the wagon. Can I take one more thing off? How to walk worthy. How to walk worthy of your calling. We done, we done talked about why we ought to walk worthy. Because of all these things God done done for you. Who ought to walk worthy? Save folks. Washed in the blood. But how to walk worthy? Two and three. He said, with all lowliness, meekness, 
with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He's telling us right there in the Bible how to walk worthy. Isn't God a good God? He says with all lowliness, it starts right there with all lowliness. What the, as I'm talking about when I say lowliness, we are, are talking about a state of mind. Humble-mindedness. That's what we are talking about. The Bible uh, is the opposite of having a prideful mind. Proud-mindedness. It's the opposite of that. You know, the Bible says uh, that we should not think more highly of ourselves. See, that's the thing that, 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 that wrecks families and stuff that wrecks churches, that wrecks relationships. People think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. He says you need to walk in lowliness. And not only that, he says in meekness. Now let me take my time here because people mistake that word meekness for weakness. But meekness is not weakness. See, See, this word has to deal with scrant under control. It's, uh, the word picture is like a wild stallion that has been tamed. He still got his same scrant that he always had, but now it's just under control. That's what we're talking about when we say meekness. And see, it has to deal with not retaliating. When people done made you mad. You be one to, they think they're going to get away with that. They ain't getting away with that. See, a meek person is not going to act like a wild person and, and try to retaliate. They got me, but I'm going to get them back. No, no, it, it's rent under control. You got the strength to walk away from some things. You're like a Timex watch. You can take a lick and, and keep on ticking. That's cause you got some meanness in you. And folks look at how you handle that situation. They say, I don't see how you can handle that. That's because you got the Holy Ghost on the inside. Greater is he that's within me than he that's in the world. And he says with all long suffering. That word long suffering, you know what that means? Suffering long. I know y'all was looking for something big, a big old definition. <laughs> it just means suffering long. It means patient. You know what patience means? Here it is, listen to this. It's a willingness to suffer for a while. That's what patient is. It's a willingness, I done made up my mind I'm going to suffer for a while. Oh, that, when you get to that point in life, that shows you are a strong Christian. See, the average person ain't willing to suffer for just for a little while. If we go through the drive through at McDonald's and they ain't got, what's wrong with them? Don't have me to cut my car off and go inside him. See, we live in this 
fast food thing. But how do you, uh, how many of you know that the Christian life ain't like fast food and ain't like drive through? You got to have a willingness to suffer for a while. Listen, listen, listen. First Corinthians 13 talks about love. That's the love chapter. And Paul gives characteristics of love. But the first characteristic of love is patience. If, if you get married, I say, if you get married, I say, if you get married, then you got to make up your mind, I got to suffer for a while. And if you're already there, if you're already married, you got to make up your mind. I just got to suffer a little while longer. <laughs> then he says, for bearing one another in love. Amen. He said you got to tolerate. That's what we're talking about. Tolerate. Don't fly off the hand. Forbearance. Tolerate. One another in love. Being able to live with somebody that you don't agree with. That's what we're talking about when it says forbearing. Able to deal with somebody who their opinion is different from your opinion. See, we think we can change everybody. And we get into these fights if when we find somebody, their opinion is not like our opinion. And as a result, we try to change their opinion because we think that we write all the time. And they always wrong. But how many of you know a broken clock is right two times of the day? You just got to learn how to close your mouth sometime and go on. Now you said it yourself. Tell that person like talking to a brick wall. That's because they ain't gonna let you change their mind. They done showed you that. So why are you running up your blood pressure just trying to give them a piece of your mind? No, if you're giving them a piece of your mind, that means you done lost half your mind. You better hold on to that little piece of mind that you got, because you're going to need it as you go further on down the road. Because you think that this problem is bad, you ain't seen a problem yet. And you forbear, you keep your mouth quiet in love. You don't storm out and go in the kitchen and start slanging pots and pans. I'm just tired of all of this. Boom, boom, slanging stuff against the wall. Then bringing dinner. Here your dinner is. Yeah, you for bad, but it wasn't in love. He says, endeavoring to keep the unity. Work hard to keep the unity of the spirit. Notice, it's the unity that has been brought forth by the Spirit. Notice, it's a capital S on Spirit. So it's not a unity that you done brought about. It's a unity that the Holy Spirit.
spirit has brought about in the bond of peace. In other words, when God fixed that thing, now don't you mess it up. Endeavoring to keep, that word keep means to guard the unity of the spirit. If you got a good choir, you didn't do that. Where everybody is getting along in the choir. The Holy Spirit did that. If you've got a good usher board where everybody's in love and harmony one with another, you didn't do that. God did that. If you've got a good church where the people in the church is loving on one another and in, on one accord, you didn't do that. God did that. Let me bring it home. If you and your wife, if y'all is on the same level now, y'all are in a harmony one with another. You didn't fix that like that. It wasn't always like that. God did that. For all the children and the parents, they on one accord. The mom and daddy, you didn't do that. God did that. Now, God, it don't mess it up. God, it don't mess it up. A lot of times we mess it up with our big mouth. And we know when we're getting ready to mess it up. I probably shouldn't say that. Well, you probably shouldn't say it. You probably shouldn't say it. The Spirit already done told you. The Spirit, the, the, uh, uh, the, the Holy Spirit, the lights already went out. Warning, 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 warning. You're getting ready to say something. You shouldn't say warning, warning, warning. Hush. House was in love and harmony, one with another. For it took the Spirit two or three years to put together. You done messed it up. In one moment. Endeavor and work hard, he says, to keep the unity of the Spirit. Uh, you know, a lot of times the devil gets in a church by moving people away from that church. And people leave that church too soon thinking that they have a better opportunity. That's where, well, uh, a case in point of that uh, is the uh, story of this man named John, let me get his last name right. John Fawcett. John Fawcett, he was the pastor of a little church in Wingate, England for seven years. But it was a poor church. He could barely make it, him and his wife. But an opportunity came along after staying there seven years. An opportunity came along for him to go to a, a bigger church in London and this bigger church would take care of all of his needs. He didn't have to worry about anything if he just accepted the call and that the big church. But the good thing about the Little Pole Church, all the members was in love and harmony, one with another. They loved him and he loved them and they loved one another. There was a unity of the spirit. Um, Pastor John decided to accept this big church. Uh, and so the day came for him to go ahead and start moving. 
And so he was packing up and loading up the wagon and some of the church folks came over to help uh, him move. But some of the church folks started begging him to stay, for, please stay. And a lot of the women started crying. And when Pastor John saw uh, these people crying and his wife turned to her husband and said, John, uh, these people need us here. I don't think we ought to leave. These people need us here. And Pastor John say, you're right. Uh, I think the Lord is, is telling me, just like he's telling you, we need to stay right here. And so he didn't accept that big church that could pay him big money. He stayed right there in that little bitty church there in that little bitty insignificant town there in England. But God used Pastor John in that little bitty church to touch the whole world. God dropped in his heart a song that I grew up singing in Sunday school. Some of you may have even grew up singing it. It was a song called Blessed be the tide. Blessed be the tide that bind our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of Kendrick's mind is like to that above. That was over 259 years ago. And it's still being sung today. See, God don't always bless you uh, through the normal means. God has other ways to bless you that you know not of. Like we said last week, he can do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond and above all that we can imagine or think. See, a lot of people have messed up their families by chasing after a dollar. It's getting awfully quiet in the house of the Lord. <laughs> a lot of people, they are in a place where there's love and harmony one with another, but they leave that good place where there's love and harmony one with another and chase after that dollar. And they get that dollar and they start singing, I'm catching hell. See, the devil a lot of times, he like to move you away from what you have and you lose what you had chasing after something else. Oh, you can get what you want, but you can lose what you got. See, it's bad of the Bible says to dwell in a lit poor house with quietness and peace yeah. to stay in a place where you eat steak every day yeah. and there's hell no peace one of the ways to maintain the unity of the spirit is to stay right where you're at yeah. and keep doing what you're doing just stay right there and walk it out. Walk out that lowliness. Walk out that meekness. Walk out that patience. Walk out that forbearance. Walk it out. Walk it out. I said, walk it out. You know, when I look at this text, it just reminds me of Jesus, how Jesus basically walked this out. Because Jesus, he gave an invitation. He says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give thee rest. Take your yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. 
and he walked it out because he rode into town on the back of a donkey. He could have rode to town on a chariot, but he was walking it out, ladies and gentlemen. He was saying one thing, and he was doing the same thing. He walked it out. He said he loved his disciples, and he got on his knees, and he uh, washed their dirty feet. In other words, he said that he loved them, and he showed them that he loved them. He walked it out in the same way. He said he loved the whole world, and he proved it by dying on the cross for your sin and my sin, that we may have the right to the tree of life. He said it, and he did it. He walked it out. And that's what we gotta do. We just gotta walk it out. We 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 gotta walk it out. Walk it out. Walk it out. Walk it out. When you walk it out, then you're walking worthy of your call. As I come to a close, France went through a revolution, the French Revolution of 1792. In that revolution, they arrested Louis, Louis de 16th, who was the king of France. They arrested him and his wife. They tried him in trial. They was found guilty. And they brought him and his wife to the guillotine. And they chopped off both of them here. But they also arrested their little boy that was seven years old. And they put him in prison. That was Louis the 17th. And because they hated his father, they tried to change Louis the 17th identity. They would often come in there and they tried to train him to be a, a bad boy so he can come up and be a bad man. And they came in there and they tried to teach him how to talk bad and say evil things and wicked things. And they tried to teach him uh, how to do wicked things and evil things and bad things. But sometimes things were so uh, uh, bad that they wanted him to say or something was so bad that they wanted him to do. Little Louis the 17 would say, I, I can't say that. I can't do that because I was born to be a king in the same way this old world is trying to brainwash you it's trying to make you uh, do some bad things and say bad things do bad things because it's trying to mess with your identity but you need to be like little Louis the 17th and rebel against this old world and this old devil teaching and say I can't say that I can't do that because I was born to be a king that's walking word of your calling are you walking worthy of your calling? Walk worthy of your calling. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this lesson. Take this lesson and use it to bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.